Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. I feel many of you we have a room right here in this building. Right? Uh, but uh, this room is nice. It's very convenient. It's just across the street from MSE and slightly bigger than that one. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, actually it's also a very special guest today. Uh, he's uh, our only guest from this semester for ICON seminar. Uh, again, by the name, uh, by the way, my name is Yuan Wang, I'm an assistant professor in civil engineering and also one of the co-organizers for ICON seminar. And our guest, uh, Dr. In Zhou, uh, here, he flew actually all the way from San Francisco, uh, Bay Area, to here, just to give a talk to all of our faculty and, and students right here uh, about their activities uh, that they are doing at Waymo. <coughs> and a senior uh, manager at Waymo, and his team has been about perception, planning, prediction, uh, all those exciting stuff uh, that he will talk about. Uh, before that, he was a tech lead manager at Apple, uh, who is also working on Apple. Probably someone just joined. And prior to that, he also worked in Samsung research uh, uh, for a couple of years. Uh, Dr. Joe got his uh, PhD degree from University of Delaware uh, in ECE department uh, in 2014, and his graduate degree from Beijing Jiao Tong University uh, back in 2009. Okay, without further ado, let's uh, uh, pass the uh, mic to Dr. Joe. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yun Zhou. Uh, at the beginning, I first want to thank Professor Wang for the invitation. It is actually my great uh, honor to be here. Uh, back in 2009, when I was applying grad school, Purdue University was one of my dream school. Uh, but my credential was not that great, so I didn't get in. But it is my, my fortune to be here, to communicate, to share my learnings over the years, how I you know, uh, learn through the PhD through the industry, and now I was able to work in Waymo. And yeah, uh, feel free to uh, jump in, ask questions while I talk. So I don't have a thorough rehearsal of my slides, so it may go beyond one hour. <laughs> so in uh, apology first, but I hope to have a deep uh, conversation, communication with all of you. Okay, I will, without further ado, I will start. So um, today my topic is total scene understanding for autonomous driving. This is uh, today's agenda. In the first half of today's presentation, I will first give an introduction about Waymo and then talk about the history of our company. And then at high level, I want to bring everyone on the same page by, provi by providing you a high level overview of the technology we built in Waymo for full autonomous driving, which we call the Waymo driver. And in the second half of the talk, I will have a deep dive with you and we will discuss um, the scalability challenge for autonomous driving. Specifically, I will go, go over some of our recent publications, such as how can we scale up our training data for deep learning models and how can we generalize <coughs> a machine learning model to long tail cases. Okay. So uh, to start out, I want to take some time and talk about the mission and touch on a few milestones we have achieved over the past 15 years. So at Waymo, our mission is to build the most experienced driver in the world to make the transportation of people and things easy and safe. And since we started in 2009 as a self-driving car project inside Google, we have driven over 20 million miles on the public road, 20 billion miles in simulation, and over 25 cities across the US. And I want to share a couple of videos captured by our writers. There's a Waymo. Here's my Waymo. Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> Audio. Waymo. 
Keep Here's my way now. No? Hmm, interesting. What about now? I'll use my pop. This goes away now. Can you hear from the Zoom? Yeah, we can hear actually for the awesome. online attendance. Awesome. Thank you for confirming. Change the microphone. Which one? Can keep this. Okay. Microphone change. To. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Let me play the. Goes away now. Here's my way now. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. <laughs> there is no one in the front. Hi. 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 Check out our driver. <laughs> How do you feel so far in this car? Really relaxed. <laughs> the thing that surprised me was just how peaceful it feels and how fast I got used to it. My favorite thing about riding in a Waymo is I can be as dressed up as I want and no one's going to ask me where I'm going. Why is it's better so than Disneyland. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I mean, you can totally feel the excitement and the surprise from these actual passengers in our vehicle when they see this futuristic uh, riding experience. And that also makes Waymo employees, as myself, super proud of our technology. So we are currently offering this rider-only driving ser service in San Francisco, as well as in Phoenix. And we will soon bring our L4 robot taxi experience to Los Angeles and Austin. To experience the Waymo driver, super simple. You just download the Waymo One app on your mobile phone, choose your pickup location, and enter your destination as you are using other rider sharing app. A Waymo robot taxi will come and pick you up. I highly encourage you to experience it when you visit those cities in the future. So now let's talk about the Waymo driver, our fully self driving system. So we'll start with hardware and then we'll talk about uh, the software. So this is a uh, bird's eye view of our uh, driver hardware system. It contains a suite of calibrated sensors, including LiDAR, camera, and radar. And there's also a very powerful AI compute unit at the back trunk of the vehicle. As you know, LiDAR is, is one of the most powerful sensor we mounted on the vehicle, it has the advantage of seeing the world in 3D with great detail. It can also see objects in the dark of night. However, LiDAR is not perfect. It's very sensitive to adverse weather conditions, such as rain, fog, or snow. We also have camera on the vehicle. It can give rich color and texture information, and it's, it is particularly useful for long-range perception. Still, this modality has its drawback. One of the drawbacks is it's very sensitive to the poor illumination conditions. And that's why we we'll include a radar sensor. In-house Waymo, we have developed a high-resolution radar system, which can detect uh, and track static and dynamic objects, regardless if it's far away or the objects are closely distant. The radar is actually a very nice complement to light on the camera, especially in those challenging you know, weather conditions and illumination conditions. So all the sensors together, we are, our sensor suite is able to perceive the world in a complete view with 360 degrees. This is actually laid the necessary foundation for the vehicle to navigate safely in the world. On the software side, there are four major modules that are running in real time in a coordinated way. In the next couple of slides, I will walk you through one by one. So the first one is location. This module aims to answer the question, where I am for the vehicle. At a local scale, at a local uh, region, this localization module enabled the vehicle to understand static scene surroundings. 
such as you can see the crosswalk in front of the vehicle, the road, the road technology, the traffic light, as well as stop sign. These are the static surroundings necessary for safe driving. And a global view, right? This localization actually provides crucial information for routing and planning. Routing means we need to build a roadmap from the current location to the final destination. It can be a couple of miles or hundreds of miles away, like we use the navigation map on Google. And it also uh, tells uh, information for the local path planning. The local path planning needs to follow the roadmap guided by the router and find a feasible and a safe path to make progress. And the second module is perception. These tasks aim to you know, always look for the object on the road, such as traffic participants, like um, the traffic control signal, or any dynamic blockages like a construction zone. So we need to be able to circumvent and avoid collision. Actually, there's a lot of complexity here to work with. You can imagine in such a case, this is a real driving log we captured in San Francisco downtown. <clears throat> It's very busy. In order to safely navigate this space, we not only need to localize the pedestrian locations, we also need to understand their gestures, their pose, postures, or even eye gaze in order, to, in order to truly understand the pedestrian's intention. And the third module I want to mention is the behavior prediction. These tasks aims to to tell based on what we have per perceived, what those objects will do next. The task is formulated as a trajectory prediction problem for all the objects uh, we, have, we have observed from perception. Basically, the input is a motion history of the object, as well as information about the environment. In environments include uh, the road topology information, as well as traffic state information. Again, this uh, module also has its unique challenges, just to mention a couple of them here. The first one is that uh, the future prediction itself is a multi-model problem in nature. Think of, uh, we, for example, here we are at the intersection and the, the, the road user may go straight or make a turn. And our software needs to anticipate all the possible futures. And the second of all here is that there are interactions among agents. By only predicting the marginal trajectory of each agent may, may generate some physically impossible one, such as these two collisions, which typically don't happen on, on, the, on the real world. So we need, our system has to be able to make the joint future prediction of the in, among the interacting agent. And finally, the fourth module is the planning. This, this module takes the input from the localization, perception, as well as prediction, and then decide what should I do in order to safely and efficiently progress. The output of this planner module includes optimized paths, the speed we should travel. And this <clears throat> task is also very challenging and receiving a lot of attention lately because in the first hand, it needs to consume all the uh, upper stream modules and reason about the context. And there's always uncertainty uh, within the signal passed to this module. The second of all, this, when the agent is paving the real world, it's always interacting with some other road users. So you have to plan in accordance to others' reaction in an interactive way. So to quickly summarize, we can put all the hardware and the software pieces in this figure. The, um, the perception will take input from the raw sensor <coughs> operations, the map uh, information, as well as the localization result. And it, its output is a representation of the world, which is fed to the behavior prediction or the prediction model to roll out into future power trajectories. And then the planner will take the output from all the previous modules and decide what I should do next. That's a very high level summary. So you may already notice among all of these blocks, 
the blocks in green color are the ones that artificial intelligence and data-driven approaches are playing more and more important role in recent years. And in today's presentation, I will mainly focus on the perception and behavior prediction module. Okay, so now we are entering the second half of, the, of this talk. We will be discussing the scalability challenges in autonomous driving. So at Wemo, we invest heavily and do applied research on auto labeling technologies. These approaches will enable us to more efficiently to understand the semantics of the world. By efficiency, I mean with less cost and with faster development speed to improve our model. And this is still not enough. We also need to anticipate the open world um, environment. That's why we are studying uh, this new emergent research trend called open set perception and prediction. These are the critical capabilities for the vehicle to navigate and to handle unknown things in the world. I will elaborate further when we go when we reach that slide. Oh, lovely. So in this work, we'll be mainly focusing on how can we automate the labeling process for 3D object detection for point cloud. Point cloud is a sensor that generates 2.5D surface of the 3D world. So it's, as you can imagine, um, the point cloud quality can vary based on the environment. It, can have, it may be affected by the weather, it may be affected by the pollution or by the distance. So to accurately detect objects in the point cloud itself is already a non-trivial task. And to create a label by human it's also a very slow and a costly process. And that's why we want to automate this process. So back in uh, 2021, we have published a work called Offboard Perception. Uh, as you can see in this video, our system is able to generate a very high quality and consistent auto labels across all the frames. This will be used as a supervision to train our object detection model. Our core idea is that you know, when the self-driving car is moving in the environment, we can see different aspects of the same object. And if we can you know, aggregate, integrate different viewpoints, we will be able to complete its shape. And then it will be a much easier job to put an accurate bounding box to cover this object. So I want to give you an introduction about our pipeline. So the pipeline to our auto labeling system is a raw sequence of point clock, which may last maybe 10 seconds or 20 seconds at 10 hertz. We will first run a object detection algorithm to generate the box proposals. The red bounding boxes are the proposals in each frame. And then we will apply tracking to link all the object bounding boxes across time. And as you can imagine, right, some of the objects in the world are static, like parts of vehicles. <laughs> some of them are moving. So we, in order to achieve the best possible auto labeling quality, we use a divide and conquer approach to separately handle completely static versus dynamic object. <coughs> and we will apply this uh, divide and conquer strategy to extract track information for object of different emotion state. And we de develop customized, specialized machine learning model to generate to refine the bounding boxes from the initial proposals. In the end, we have the high quality auto label to train our, our machine learning model. One application of, of this auto labeling is to auto label huge amount of data for motion prediction. Typically in the industry, motion prediction data set it can be at least a two orders of magnitude larger than a perception data set. And if we, are, we were to use um, human label <laughs> to annotate the motion prediction data set, the cost will be easily of the chart. And, this can, and as you can see in this video, um, we, we, our auto labels are quite stable and accurate, even in this very busy street. So a natural question many folks would, would like to ask. 
the natural question people usually ask is how good in quality are your auto labels compared to human labels? So here we want, I want to show you a human label analysis. So we use the standard intersection of union IOU uh, metric to measure the box quality. And then we define the quality measure using a threshold, either 0.7 or 0.8. The higher it is, the more demanding it is to your auto labels. First of all, um, when we, oh, yeah, we are also evaluating the bonding box quality in the full 3D view or in the top-down projected bird's eye view. So first of all, if we look at LU equals to 0.7, we can see that our 3D auto labeling is already very close to the human label quality in the metric. And then when we increase the evaluation criteria to 0.8, which is more demanding, we're surprised to see that our auto label in the BEV evaluation is even slightly better than humans. We think this, we hypothesis, this might be because our auto labeling is a natural smoothing and ensembling process, which removes some of the human noise. But we, at the same time, observe that there's a big, bigger performance gap in the 3D side. You can see the human label is about 60%, but the auto label has only 56%. Yeah, question? What's the uh, ground truth like the bounding box here? That's a good question. So we hire professional experienced labelers, um, multiple of them, and then we do an average ensemble of results and treat this ensemble result as a golden ground truth. And then we hire another group of labelers and <coughs> compare their label to this ensemble of golden ground truths to get the human label accuracy. That's a great question. And how can we improve this, this 3D, full 3D box quality? And that leads to our next work, which we call the MODA. The key idea is to use motion forecasting to help the, the LiDAR detector to see better. I'm using this video to give you a high level intro. As you can tell, this, as you can see, this goalkeeper saved the ball but he didn't actually look at the ball when, when he saved the ball. So that means he's using his built-in motion forecasting capability to predict the future trajectory and location of the ball. So if we can use motion forecasting as a virtual sensor modality to augment the LIDAR, original raw LIDAR point mm -hmm. cloud, we might be able to make, to make the detection an easier job for the detector. That is our motivation in this work. So I, before we jump in the detail, I want to explain you in depth what are the challenging cases that is blocking our number going higher. So we, we, we call it observation sparsity. In, in this example, right, we use some state-of-the-art detector we developed in Waymo, which we call SW former, and we test it on a diverse set of data. Mm -hmm. And we found that observation sparsity are typically resulted by you know, occlusion of an object or of objects that are simply far away, too far away, that we only see very few LiDAR points, very few LiDAR terms. <clears throat> and when, as you can, if you can remember in our auto labeling pipeline, our initial state are the single frame object detection proposals. We can only refine this proposal <clears throat> only if the proposal is reasonably good, meaning it cannot be a false positive, and it cannot be, there cannot be a false negative. If there's a false negative, you have no box to refine. If it's a false positive, even though you refine, it's still a wrong object. And we found even under the observation sparsity, even the state of the art algorithm or detector still largely suffer from this um, uh, observation sparsity, and which either leads to false uh, positive detection or false negative. And we want to improve in these two categories. So let me explain you how we can create one modar point. So suppose now we are seeing one LiDAR point cloud captured at current timestamp T. And what we'll do is we'll look at the neighbor frames with respect to the current time. 
and we can look uh, maybe uh, nine seconds back into the history or nine seconds into the future. And, de and depending on you know, whether our setting is causal or non-causal, our track can contain either future or only the history information. And next, we, we have the, uh, the sequence information, which can be considered as motion history. And then we can run a pre-trained motion predictor based on this data and generate a predicted location of the object at the current time step. And then we can convert this predicted location and use the box centers as our modal point. And the first step is simply combining the generated modal point with the original point cloud. Then we get the augmented point cloud. We can apply the same process to all the neighboring frames. And we will get many more modal points. We have to also consider that the future prediction is a multi-model problem. We can allow more than one trajectory predicted from each uh, motion history and generate a more possible location of this object. So our final modal point cloud, the virtual modality point cloud, is, a, is our uh, now ensemble set of points generated from multiple frames and the multiple motion hypotheses. Even though we are you know, generating modal points through multiple resources, the actual number of points we generated is still very fractional and negligible compared to the original point cloud. Roughly, it only contains 5% compared to the original point cloud. So it introduces only a small amount of uh, overhead in processing. In practice, we find that um, in addition to encode the modal point with only X, Y, Z coordinate, but also augmenting mm -hmm. other features can lead to improve the result. The information we have tried and found beneficial include right, the object semantics, uh, whether this motor is generated for vehicle or pedestrian or some other object. The geometry information, how big the object is, it is a useful prior <clears throat> to be included. And the last piece of information is, is uncertainty. Um, the, the motion prediction model comes with a uh, probability score. It tells how confident the location <coughs> is. We can include that as a model to reason how to trust this generated model point. Now we have talked about how we generate the modal point. I want to show you in this pipeline, how can we apply it in the detection task? Here, our input is still a raw sequence of minor point cloud. At the beginning, we choose a frame and we have the raw minor point. And now we apply the process I just described to generate the modal point for this current time step. And then we combine the generated modal point cloud with the original minor point cloud. And this is a visualization of the generated modal point. Here, there are three colors, the red, the red point, this is what, the red, the red points are the motor points predicted using the forward motion forecasting algorithm. And the blue points are, are generated through the reverse processing from future uh, sequence back, pro, back predicted in the current time step. And the green points are the original LIDAR. So combining this original LIDAR and the, the virtual modality motor point, we get augmented point cloud. And we, we can apply this for all the training data. And then we, we train another LIDAR detector specializer for the combined point cloud. Based on this data and this model, we will do a much better job in detection with much improved detection accuracy. Here is an example in the heavy occlusion case. On the left, you can see a state-of-the-art LiDAR detection and its performance under occlusion. As you can see, there's a vehicle that gradually got occluded <coughs> and become completely occluded. The detector will lose its power in this case. However, with the help of MODAR on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the same object can be consistently detected 
very reliably there. And another big advantage of MODA is we can greatly expand our detection range. The, the, the blue boxes are the results generated by the original LiDAR basic detector. The green boxes are based on the augmented point cloud with the help of MODA point. So by combining our MODAR method with our state-of-the-art detector, we are able to greatly improve our auto looking quality. And we, this is the result we got on the Wim Open data set. And the metric, aggregated metric is shown on the very right, which is L2, uh, 3D, and EPH. You can see our number has greatly improved by five points. Okay, uh, is there any questions so far? Um, this part? Probably a quick one. You showed that occlusion. What was the occlusion? I mean, what was the object that occluded uh, from the eagle perspective to that vehicle? Because I didn't see anything in between. Uh, there is a vehicle. So our our vehicle is, is, is over here. Uh -huh. So you can see this vehicle is on oh, that one. Okay. Okay. Our vehicle is on the left. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned about stitching the points, right, from one frame to the other frame. Yeah. But because the car is moving, mm -hmm. there will be some points which were there in the previous frame, but that are not there in the frame after a few seconds. And also there will be new points which were not there. You will not be able to match all the points, right? Oh, we don't. So we don't have to match all the points. So we only predict object location okay. in the targeted frame. Okay. Whereas the original observation for the point from previous frame or future frame will not be carried over to the targeted frame. Okay. But in the targeted frame, we might also have new objects which are not there in the... That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. You're true. Um, but since we, in the auto-labeling framework, we are not bounded by the causality constraint. Okay. We can also look into the future okay. and look at it backwardly. Okay. So that's why we're able to pretty much cover all the objects may appear on the road. That's a good question. Uh, okay, so is next I will talk about open set perception and prediction. So as you may already know that in the current autonomy system, the object detection and behavior prediction models are trained only for common object types, such as vehicles and pedestrians. But there are just so many long tail cases or even unknown, unseen categories of objects, like a dinosaur during Halloween time or a landed <laughs> plane on the road. So, <laughs> These may happen arbitrarily on the road. We cannot assume we'll have a prior collected training data to handle these cases. So how can we build a more robust, adaptive perception system to handle all of these long tail and unknown cases will be very critical for, for the safety of our vehicles. So one idea we, ha we, we had is how about right, we generate auto labels in a class agnostic manner? And these auto labels will augment all the human created supervisions in such a way we close the blind spot. And our idea is quite simple. So ideally, we want to have a system that is fully, you know unsupervised without humans help in the loop in such a way we can scale it up leverage all the raw on the <coughs> data and that uh, that is our dream here so in this work we explore an idea of using unsupervised scene flow to discover all the moving objects on the road and in such a way we can create other labels for these moving objects and generate the bounding box for them in a totally unsupervised manner. And by doing so, we can leverage the full log we have accumulated over one and a half decade. We can cover all the highly diverse traffic participants on the road 
and make our model truly, you know, able to scale up its capability of detecting long tail and unseen objects. So our pipeline has two major components. One is the unsupervised scene flow estimation, and the second is automatic labeling. And after the automatic labeling, we will generate the 3D bounding box boxes for each frame, as well as a 3D track plate across the sequence. The bounding boxes for each frame will be used to train object detection, while the other you know, track plate will be used to, to train motion prediction models. Let's take a deeper look into you know, each of these modules. So the scene flow estimation is to generate the point-wise flow vector for each lighter point cloud. The flow vector is the delta x, delta y, delta z, how the lighter point will move in the next frame. So as you can imagine, this, the whole scene of lighter point cloud is super complex. It may contain vehicle, pedestrian, trees, road surface, all things you name it. And if you scan, compare two adjacent scans of point cloud, they don't usually match. If you just do subtraction, you will get a very spurious velocity everywhere. So what, what we do here is we first do static, we first do ground removal to remove the ground. And you can imagine that if we flip the world, all the other objects will fall, naturally separable. And then we'll apply a static object removal. We will look at a longer time horizon and then compare whether the object, the point has shifted. If after a long time horizon, the object is not moving far, we can assume it's probably static. We don't care, and we ruin this part as well. And next, we apply a divide and conquer approach to, have to estimate flow for each of these colorful clusters. We don't solve a global flow for the entire scene or we solve local flow for each of the cluster. This will be better capture, uh, you know, um, more diversified speed and velocity or the deformable shape information of the object. And as you can tell on the right, we are able to you know, estimate the local uh, velocity information for a wide range of traffic participants. So let me uh, show you how qualitatively how the flow looks like. Uh, here I'm showing you is an actual LiDAR point cloud capture at time t. And as you can imagine, right, um, when there are dynamic objects moving around our vehicle, like this um, vehicle and this cyclist, you can expect the point on this object will drift when you look at the future time frame. And if the scene flow estimation is accurate, then it should be actually match the actually observed the next frame point cloud. And now we can overlay the predicted point cloud in T plus one. As you can tell, the predicted green points almost match exactly to the actually observed future point cloud. That indicates the quality of our scene flow estimation. Okay, based on the estimated scene flow of of the point, we, what we want to do here is we want to do a temporal integration based on the flow of the object in such a way, even though we may at the beginning have a partial observation of the object, after integration, we have gradually more complete shape of this object. So we start with initial proposal based on the visible region of the object, and we apply tracking and a shape registration to gradually refine its shape, expand up until it's a full shape. And that leads to our final auto label of this object. And this final, finally refined bounding box will be our auto label to train 3D object detector or the behavior prediction models. This is a video uh, uh, of a detector, out, detector output trained with our fully unsupervised auto labels. It's already quite promising to see this detector is able to pick up pretty much all the traffic participants as long as they are moving in the scene, like the vehicles and <coughs> pedestrians. Notably, there's still quite some room to improve. For example, you can see there's a lot of jitter or you know, scattered noise boxes produced. And I will talk another work, more recent work that can you know, uh, better handle these cases. So 
but we find that this approach can even detect out of label some of the missed ones in our human crafted WIM open data set. This is an example. You can tell there's a person pushing a stroller. Somehow there's no found box created for the stroller. Our algorithm is able to detect these two objects are moving all together and can feasibly place a bounding box covering both of them. And as a result, a detector trainer with our auto label is also able to localize both of these objects safely and physically. Like I introduced earlier, our goal of developing this fully unsupervised auto labeling and training paradigm is not to replace human supervision. It's not to, you know, um, launch a completely unsupervised model on four, but rather we want to provide this open set auto label to complement human generated label for closed set concept in such a way we can remove reduce the blind spot to the long tail and unseen object types. So based on open data set, we can define <coughs> an experiment to mimic this open set uh, environment. Here, we are grouping all the human labeled objects into two categories. One is vehicle, the other is vulnerable road user. The vulnerable road user contains uh, walking pedestrians and cyclists. We all consider them vulnerable road user. So in this setting, we assume the model when training in a fully supervised way can only have access to one category of the object. If they are trained with a vehicle, then there's no uh, human label for VRU and vice versa. In this way, we're creating such an open set setting. Because, go ahead. Oh, just a question. So far, what you told us is only for in clouds, no cameras involved yet? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, in this, so far, we have been only talking about LiDAR. Later, I will show how can we leverage image to improve. So, because the current 3D detector in nature is fully supervised, it will learn to reward positive supervision and penalize what has been taught as background. So it will keep in a completely blind eye, if trained well, to the open set category. But with the help of our auto label combined into the training set, we are able to boost up the performance of the open set category. In here, what we truly care is the average accuracy performance of the two categories. You can tell, you can see here, right, with the help of auto label, we are able to improve the mean average precision uh, very significantly. That's the <coughs> job for the overall system safety. And for trajectory prediction, we observe the same. A trajectory prediction trained only on the closed set concept does not generalize well to the long tail cases. You may think, well, all the things are moving, right? There's no intrinsic dif dif difference, but it's actually not. If you uh, take a close look at the second row, when we train with a VRU pedestrian ground truth, but apply it on the open set vehicle, the error is quite large. The, the behavior simply doesn't generalize across categories. With the help of auto label, are able to get an open set trajectory predictor for all the traffic participants. I just want to mention this bolded line, 1.89 and 4.79 result are already within 5% of error compared to a fully supervised uh, trajectory prediction. And this is very interesting uh, to see. Um, this is because we believe the trajectory prediction itself has a many more training data, and the, the signal itself always contains some noise. So the model itself is more robust to this data noise, and it's able to generalize well, even using this uh, relatively lower quality auto label compared to the perception case. Perception case, if you look at the accuracy, um, the open set accuracy is much lower than if you train supervised. But on the trajectory prediction, the performance gap between unsupervised and supervised is much smaller. That's a good sign. That means you you can still do a good great job in the trajectory prediction. And here I'm 
I'm showing you some real world um, challenging scenarios we found in when we're deploying our service. On the left, you can see a person holding a plywood, uh, <laughs> walking very slowly across the road. And on the right hand side, you can see a person holding a dumpster backward. <clears throat> and in either of these cases, our model is able to confidently detect it, detect them, and estimate its velocity. Okay. Uh, is there any questions so far for this part of the work? I think in terms of a computation complexity, first of all, we are talking about auto framework where the system is not supposed to run on board on a vehicle. We can apply a complex, powerful model offline in a data center. So there's not much latency constraint. The second of all, um, the latency for processing point cloud has been much reduced <clears throat> since you know deep neural net specialized the deep neural network developed for point cloud data. The point cloud in the first side is a unordered set of coordinates, variable number point, and there's no order. This is in contrast to the uh, image yeah. grid. But um, with the recent developments, there has been many algorithms, efficient ones, that can transform this layer point cloud into an efficient tensor representation that is very suitable to run on the modern GPU and or TPUs. In terms of you know, total computational cost, it's already very fast. I have a question. So we lost much of both this by voxels. These are voxel representations, right? In the, the presentation. So how do you see the like usage of voxels and if, if, if we were to use any kind of let's say variation of vision transformers on top of them? So what would you consider to be the problem of tokenization, which is pretty common in let's say words, how would that represent here? So first of all, how do you make tokens in such a space? I'm assuming it's just an extension of making the system. Well, these transformers and extending it to the temporal domain to me, but how because the problem of tokenization will still stand, and that, that's one of the things that I found was pretty interesting with uh, for the big jump in the in the models from let's say GPT towards the newer LM. Mm -hmm. And second problem was about domain adaptation because a lot of this work seems to be a, a lot about domain adapting from in different scenarios. And I was, I'm assuming, so do you consider different weathers as to be different domains, and what kind of sort of like uh, heuristics or temp, uh, important? Uh, parameters that you judge that whether your your models with management is adapting across different domains, it doesn't do well. So what are the heuristics or let's say the metrics that you judge? I mean, it's not simple metrics, it'll be some much more complicated. And second thing, how do you look at the formation of tokens and how how what is the role of tokenization in that respect in box of domain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the to tokenization idea yeah. is very new and it received quite some interest in the research community. Yeah. We can totally represent the scene as a set of tokens. And apply, you know, modern architecture like transformers to perform traditional perception tasks. Yeah. I've seen work since maybe recent one or two years tokenizing yeah. multimodality sensors and do fusion in a transformer way, and they, they usually lead to performance improvement. But the challenge here, although I believe this is the true, there's a lot of potential to get good performance, yeah. but the latency is one of the constraints. Limiting its, you know, um, application or onboard application in a computationally constrained platform. And your second question is about uh, the adaptation. Yes. So, tip, <laughs> you're right. Uh, we typically consider uh, weather, different weather conditions as uh, different domains. And how do we def how do we measure the performance? We can just use the traditional uh, academic. Uh, performance evaluation to determine whether these, these two weather conditions cause drastically different uh, behavior in terms of detection performance or trajectory. Yeah, uh, you can come to me after the comment. So. 
Okay, so um, in the <coughs> in the last part of my talk today, I want to introduce you to a relatively new and emerging topic in the industry, as well as in the academia, which is open vocabulary 3D understanding. So in contrast to the previous work, either we do closed set detection or autolipic, or class agnostic open set detection. These tasks require the 3D perception model to generalize itself automatically to new concept beyond the knowledge or the semantic concept taught during the training time. This is very much needed because we are still need to handle different objects in the world according to their attributes. We may need to yield with a larger buffer to pedestrians than vehicles. Or we may need to yield or be more politely when depending on you know, uh, the behavior, the potential behavior of this person, whether the person is carrying a large heavy good or the person is just jogging. So all these information need to reason about the semantic attributes. How can we enable the current perception system to understand, to understand them without the need of explicitly creating human label is something we need to resolve here. And this is very important for Tom's strategy. So we can see some concrete examples here that we have observed on the road. One is the vehicle, right? There's an oversized vehicle in front of, and there's another vehicle, all right, on fire. All of these may lead to safety critical consequences if we don't tell their semantics. Human driver can deal with them quite easily. And here's another example where there can be special force vehicles on duty. And a human driver can tell, I should avoid, I should drive responsibly as a model citizen. A human has a reasoning capability to know they're on duty and how should, how should I avoid engaging with this zone, but it's not trivial for the self-driving car. And as a robot taxi, we should be at least to be polite in picking up the passenger. And I should be able to choose the right and friendly location to drop the person off. And these also require accurate understanding of uh, passengers as well as the context, the scene context. All of these are trivial to human drivers because our brain has been trained um, sufficiently long in that depends on when you get a driver license. But for the, for the perception system, it's really not trivial. It's a very challenging and exciting topic to work on. So to this end, in the last year at CCB, we have published a work called Unsupervised Perception based on vision language model distillation. So as you can see in these demo images, um, our model, our 3D detection model, LiDAR-based, is able to accurately detect the object based on the text prompt. It can detect a specific type of construction vehicle, like a doughbozer, fire truck, or a specific type of Jeep. What makes us um, super interesting is that it can even can understand uh, the jaywalking behavior. If you look closely, there are multiple pedestrians in the scene on the top right of the image. Some are standing, only, only a couple of them are jaywalking. But the model is able to understand the motion attributes from this text. And only localize these jaywalking pedestrians. So this is the true power from the vision language model. So before we jump into the technical detail, I can give you maybe a high-level overview about the vision language model. As you may know recently, the large scale vision language model have seen great success in generalizing to a wide range of vision tasks, like image classification, segmentation, and visual question answering. I think one of the, um, well, I would say, besides the performant architecture transformer, the huge amount and abundant training data also plays a, great, a critical role in all these successes. But unfortunately, there's no such large freely available training set or data set for 3D perception. And that makes our hope to generalize our 3D models to open vocabulary concepts particularly challenge. 
So here, we want to develop a data efficient approach by directly leveraging the knowledge from a pre-trained 2D image foundation model and use that information to train our 3D model. Our core idea is to leverage the sensor calibration information between camera and LiDAR. In such a way, we can build a correspondence between pixel and points. By establishing such a correspondence, we can associate feature information from the feature map of a camera, a vision language model, to each LiDAR point. In this way, we are building a bridge from 2D foundational world to 3D model world. So our, our pipeline is actually quite straightforward. First step, we do unsupervised multi-modality auto label with the help of vision language model. And then next, we train, we augment any existing of the shelf 3D model with a desolation loss for vision language. In this experiment, we use a popular 3D detector called Point Pillar, and we use a vision language model called OpenSec, developed by Google Brain a couple of years ago. So here's how it works. Our input are a pair of point cloud sequence and corresponding camera image. And we, we will derive two forms, two forms of uh, the label. One form is our old frame bounding boxes. We can apply the same um, unsupervised motion inspired um, uh, geometric pipeline to generate bounding boxes. On the other hand, we also need to generate uh, features for each LiDAR point. This is based on query to the image feature map by leveraging the point pixel correspondence. If we have n point, n point in the point cloud, we will gather n features for the, for the point cloud. And we can also play some tricks here by applying some prior knowledge. If we are not interested at all, or we, we are almost always sure certain type of object will not be our object of interest. We can remove them from the point cloud by just apply a query to the image model, filter out the relevant category of points, like the road surface, building, or vegetation. And these will you know, make our processing a lot uh, more robust. And the training is very straightforward. It's our training objective is just a combination of standard um, detection loss plus a point-wise feature distillation loss. And then testing time, how can we make our train detector running the same speed as the <coughs> closed set counterpart, <coughs> but it can generalize to new concept? This is how it works. At inference time, after training, we can throw away the images and image foundation model. All the information has been infused to this 3D model. So the input is just point cloud. But the, the network will output two pieces of information. The first is class agnostic boxes. At this stage, these are just a raw proposals. There's no semantic associated to each of them. And at the same time, we have another branch outputting the point wise features for each of the points of the LiDAR point cloud. And then we apply the text encoder to a set of uh, uh, queries that we want to detect for. And we will apply a clip type of cosine similarity to each of the point features. And in the end, each LiDAR point will be associated to a concept. And, and finally, we, we can apply majority voting based on the points inside of each box to decide the semantic for that bounding box. And in this way, we derive open vocabulary object detection capability without the help of any human supervision. And then this new approach with the help of image language foundation model has multiple benefits. First one compared to the motion inspired unsupervised perception just presented in the last part, it can detect both static and dynamic object, obviously. And it because it leveraged the 
vision length, the camera information, it reduced a lot of, of positives with much better auto label quality. On the other hand, um, if we want to label with specific semantics, we can do it. So it, the auto label set can be tagged with specific semantics we are interested in. We can label vehicles, we can label pedestrians, or anything we're interested in. This is not possible for the motion inspired auto price perception system. So this is a video showing on the top is our new approach, vision language empowered. The, the second uh, row is uh, the motion inspired one. As you can see, our new approach on the top can pick, um, let, let's see this. It, it remove a lot of false positive compared to the bottom one. If you look at the bottom one, there's a lot of spurious boxes generally. And this is to show that we can detect class semantic aware object for vehicle pedestrian. And this is to show that we can capture both static and dynamic object, whereas the bottom one can only pick up the moving ones. Okay. Uh, here are some quantitative results on the auto labels we created in this work. And we compare it with the motion inspired auto perception. Again, we're evaluating under two evaluation criteria, one for LU at 0.4, the other is at 0.5. On, on the 0.4, we see a reasonable improvement, about three points. But, um, but when we increase the uh, LU threshold to 0.5, we see a more pronounced improvement in our label quality. And when we train the detector, a detector based on the auto labels, we are see, seeing even greater improvement across board. That truly means our other label has much, you know, uh, much more consistent uh, temporal information and shape information compared to the previous one, the motion inspired approach. Okay, I uh, just want to mention all of these work are not possible, will not be possible without this WIM open data set. This is the, probably the highest quality and large scale data set you can find for autonomous driving path, and it's and it is still expanding and evolving. So if you are interested in trying your own idea for autonomous driving, please give it a try. By the way, we are hosting a workshop and challenge series in this year's CVPR to be held in Seattle. If you are interested to compete with other uh, company or schools, feel free to participate in the challenge. And that. In my talk. Thank you so much. As Dr. Joe mentioned, uh, if you're interested, uh, definitely uh, feel free to check out that workshop uh, competition. And you're not just competing with all the other